<clears throat> the Easter story is nothing but a myth. Jesus' high school teacher, science teacher, announced to his class, sorry, Jimmy's high school science teacher, getting ahead of myself this morning, Jimmy's science, high school science teacher, said to the class just before Easter, Jesus not only didn't rise to the grave, he continued, but there's no God in heaven who would allow his son to be crucified in the first place. Sir, I believe in God, Jimmy protested, and I believe in the resurrection. Jimmy, you can believe what you want to, what you wish to. That's, that's your right, of course, the teacher replied. However, the real world excludes the possibility of miraculous events such as resurrection that, they, that you Christians celebrate at Easter. The resurrection is a scientific impossibility. No one can believe in miracles who can also respect science. But God isn't limited to science, Jimmy replied. He alone, he created science. Engaged by Jimmy's outspoken faith, the leader, the teacher, proposed a scientific experiment. Reaching into his classroom refrigerator, he pulled out a raw egg and he showed it to the class. He held it up. I'm going to drop this egg to the floor, he said, and gravity, science, will pull it toward the floor with such force that the egg will most certainly break in front of you all. Fixing Jimmy... With a look of challenge, the teacher concluded, Now, Jimmy, I want you to pray to your God right here this morning and ask him to keep this egg from breaking when it hits the floor. And if he can do that, then you've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's a God and that there can be such a thing as Easter. I want to see that miracle. After pondering for a moment the challenge, Jimmy slowly rose to his feet to pray. And he said this, Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that when my teacher drops the egg, it will break into a hundred pieces. And also, Lord, I pray that when the egg does break, my teacher will have a heart attack and die right here. <laughs> Amen. After a unified gra gasp, the class, the class waited in anticipation for what the teacher would do. And for a moment, the teacher just stood there and did nothing. At last, he looked at Jimmy, and they looked at his egg. And without a, without a word, he carefully put the egg back into the refrigerator. <laughs> class dismissed, he said, and he sat down to clear his desk. Now, I don't know who's right, what, what, Jim, what Jimmy prayed, okay? <laughs> so if you're a high school student this morning, I don't encourage you to, to pray for your teacher's, teacher's death. I'm married to a teacher, so <laughs> they're nice people. <laughs> and I'm sure the teacher's test was wrong. God is not a heavenly you know, usher or bellboy that you can order around and you've got to produce a miracle for me right now. Okay, that's wrong. The Bible says that's tempting God. Devil asked Jesus to do that, right? Uh, to jump off the, the temple. That's tempting God. That sounds wrong. I don't know what was in Jimmy's mind. But I suspect he recognized that when push comes to shove, when it's between proving a point and living or dying, his teacher would rather live. <laughs> and maybe he did believe there might be a God out there. Maybe he did believe that God could strike him dead. I think that's actually kind of brilliant um, thinking for Jimmy's part. And do you want to take the risk? What if the resurrection really is true? What if there really is a God? You don't, do you want to risk your life on it by not believing in him? There's a lot of proofs for the res resurrection, by the way. There's a lot of proofs for Easter. There's, I, I shall give you a few classic proofs. There's hundreds. But let me just give you the first proof, the empty tomb is proof that Jesus rose from the dead. There's two main theories of why there was an empty tomb on Easter morning, Sunday morning. Some people say that the disciples stole the body. That was the early theory. But why would they steal the body? Like, well, How could they steal the body? They were terrified. They were hidden. And they were afraid. And they had Roman soldiers with swords there defending 
the grave. And if they st- stole the body, they can simply, you know, the, we, we, we can, the soldiers can give testimony, all that stuff, right? And how can they? Then, then some other people say that the, the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leaders hid the body. Why would they hide the body? Why would they hide the body? And later on, when the, these disciples said that they want to start this faith, this religion, this new religion that Jesus, their leader, rose from dead, all they had to do was produce the body, if they had the body. But there was an empty tomb. And then there's the, the holy women's eyewitnesses. The Bible says Mary, Jesus first appeared to Mary Magdalene. In those days, the testimony, if you want to start a new religion about some resurrection from the dead, you don't use the testimony of women. In those days, in those days, women's testimony was not considered legal. They were not allowed to be used in court. And the last thing you do is use women. And yet, that's what these proud Jewish men had to do. When they wrote about the resurrection, they said, Jesus first appeared to women because Jesus respects women. And Jesus chose to use women as the first witnesses of his resurrection. And they embarrassingly had to say, he appeared to a woman. That shows how authentic the documents were. It wasn't just made up. How about the fact that they had, I like this one, the fact that they had new courage. They were, a few days earlier, on Good Friday, they had run away from Jesus. They had denied him three times. Now they were cowering like little chickens behind a door, afraid that they would be next because they'd been living with Jesus for three years and they were known to be Jesus' followers. The leader had just been killed. last thing he wanted to do was to tell everyone about him, but we, we find out in history that from completely fearful men, they became completely fearless men. To the point, well, to the next point, where they found so much courage they're willing to die for their faith. I did some research recently. The, the, you know, the, the Book of Mormon and the Mormon faith is based on the testimony of this guy named Joseph Smith. And to, to give credence to his, to his uh, new Faith, he said that he had found these golden tablets given to him by the, the, the uh, angel Gabriel, written on in some heavenly language, and he used first three witnesses and then eight witnesses to make a, uh, conveniently 12 witnesses who, who wrote down that we had seen these golden plates written in this heavenly language. Everyone recanted before they died. Some of them were excommunicated from the Mormon church before they died. They were all related by blood. They were not willing to die for their faith. These 12 men, and then hundreds afterwards, have been willing to die for the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. They're willing going to, especially the Apostle Paul. Here's a guy who was named Saul, who was an enemy of the church, killed people who were Christians, hunted them down like animals, and yet, after meeting the risen Christ, the, the, is, is indisputable fact that he became the greatest proponent of the Christian faith. Willing to do what he went through five. Let me get right to the list here: five floggings, three beatings, three shipwrecks, a stoning, poverty, years of ridicule. Finally, he was, he was, he was beheaded by the Emperor Nero, the Roman Emperor Nero, all because he refused to say that Jesus was not alive. He died for his faith. The Apostle Paul's life is proof. But Jesus rose from the dead. The whole fact that we are worshipping on a Sunday, why in the world would these, these dedicated Jewish Sabbatarians who, who worshipped on a Saturday all their lives, all of a sudden start worshipping on a Sunday, the day of the resurrection? There's no other explanation other than resurrection. We have proof in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. Paul says 500 people saw Christ at one time. 500. If you want to prove something in court, if you start with 500 witnesses, that's pretty solid evidence. No? Is there such a thing as the Empire State Building? Uh, Your Honor, let me bring 500 witnesses, to sh- and then each of them come for it. They swear a deposition. They swear on their life. They swear that they were, and they're willing to die on this. They say, yes, there is an Empire State Building. Even though, you, Judge, you haven't seen it, there is one. I've seen it. And every one of them, 500 witnesses come through, and they say, yes, I've seen it. And this wasn't just hall- hallucinations. Psychologists tell us today you don't have 500 people hallucinating the exact same thing. And if there was hallucinations, why did they all suddenly stop after Christ went back to heaven? Historically, there's no more testimonies of Christ's appearances after he rose from, went back to heaven. Hallucinations just don't stop at the same time. 
Christ Jesus rose from the dead. That is a verifiable, it may not be scientific proof, because scientific proof is to do with, is you do it in the lab and you repeat it over and over again. This is historical proof, not to be repeated, but just as valid, just as true. We have historical proof. Jesus rose from the dead. It's a fact. That's why we can rejoice this morning. That's why we can have joy, because Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus said, he says in John 16, our text this morning, the first verse and then the last verse, Jesus went on to say to them, in a little while you will see me no more, meaning, well, we'll discuss that in a second, and then after a little while you will see me. So, so with you, and so then in verse 22, so with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. You'll go from grief to joy. you go from tragedy to triumph. You'll have to go through a cross first, but you will end up with a crown. And I want to leave you with a very simple fact this morning. It's a very simple thought. I want you to leave you with a thought of those last uh, several words in verse 22. No one will take away your joy. I want those to be ringing in your ears. No one will take away your joy. I want you to see them for yourself. No one will take away your joy. I want you to, them, you to feel that in your heart. No one will take away your joy. I want you to get a sense that this is God speaking to you, not me. I didn't make this up. I didn't just write this down because I thought, okay, the church is going through some t- t- tough times. The, the people are going through tough times. This world is going through tough times. I'm going to make this up. No, God said to you, no one will take away your joy. It's irrevocable. You can't take it back. Can't be reversed. A lot of things in this world is reversed, isn't it? A lot of things never last. I, was, I, I, I won a Tim Hortons roll up the rim to win the other day, and I got a coffee. You, you know, so I got myself a, a latte with cream on top and, and extra large. You, know, you can get anything you want for free. And so I got it at him, Tim Hortons. I was eating, uh, drinking with a, 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 a brother from church here this week. So I, I, I used my roll up the rim win and I got another one and guess what my second one I got another one <laughs> whoa <laughs> you know and wouldn't that be neat you know I'm, I'm saying I, th- I said to my friend our brother I said you know I, you can, this, this pa- pathway you can, you can drink forever right <laughs> it's a, you know, but no you can't right next one I used it again and no didn't, didn't make it <laughs> didn't get the next one but isn't that, isn't that life good things don't last forever this guy you've heard of a guy named um, P- Pedro not Quesadilla, Quesada, Quesada. You, you, heard him, you heard him? He's from um, New Jersey. He's from New Jersey. He recently won the 338 million Powerball lottery in the States. 338 million. But you know, since he took the one time lump sum payment and then with taxes, he only gets 151 million. Okay, so I feel kind of feel sorry for him, right? Uh, <laughs> but here's this, you know, poor guy. He only won 151 million. But you know, everyone, so it's, it's, they were talking about it in the radio, and I heard their commentator. The first thing he said was, I wonder how long that will last. <laughs> I wonder when he's going to be. Because he knows, if you've read any story of all these lottery winners, because even today, there's this lady in Hamilton who won $10 million, I think, four or five years ago, and she's now living paycheck to paycheck. Because you just waste their money. Money doesn't last very long, does it? Houses don't last very long. Buildings don't last very long. You know, uh, look at the concrete things you can touch. The buildings, the skyscrapers, our homes. Look at the, some of the inner cities in the U.S. They build all these big huge mega opolises, and then the economy turns sour, people start coming to the businesses, businesses start shuttering down, the, the downtown core gets, gets dilapidated, the, the pushers move in, and it's a ghost town. It doesn't last. The concrete things in this world are not really concrete in the terms of lasting forever. It's happened before, it can happen again. It can happen in our society. Nothing lasts forever. Our Culture is fragile. Our lives are fragile. Even friends are fragile. Friendships. We lose friendships. We lose family. I was, uh, we had a, a wonderful pastor in our city who just passed away this last week. You know, he's, he, we used to call him the godfather of the ASM churches because he was a, the, the start of many of the, the churches. And to me, he was always this mighty man who was huge, not only physically, but of spirit. But, but he, had, he passed away. And they had a funeral for him yesterday. Nothing lasts forever. How can Jesus make this unconditional guarantee that your joy will be forever? 
You know, you, get, you go to a business and you, have, and you buy a, a, a something and a, on, the, on the back it says, guaranteed to give you pleasure and your, and your pleasure will never stop from this product. How many of you would believe that? How, much, how, how, how true can that be? Yet yeah, Jesus says he'll give you joy and it will last forever. What's he mean here? Let's just look a little closer in our text this morning to get some the background. He says in the first verse, 16, in a little while you'll see me no more. He's writing this, he's saying this just before the crucifixion. This is an upper room discourse. He's with his disciple. It's his last words to him, to them in, in essence. They had a nice meal together and he's saying this. And we know in a little while that, what that means is that he's going to die. That he's going to have a, 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 he's going to be crucified. He'll be killed, murdered. Then they will be confused, he says. Very truly, verse 20, you will weep and mourn. You're going to, be going crazy in a sense, like really confused, while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Then verse 21, he likens it to childbirth. Now I know, especially in our church, many of you women have gone through childbirth just recently. And so you may not believe these words, because he says in these words, in a little while there's pain and then you'll forget it. <laughs> now, I know some of you have not forgotten yet, okay? And you think you'll never forget that pain, okay? And and we men will never understand it. My sister told me it's like passing a watermelon, but I can't understand that. Okay, <laughs> I don't understand that. But it's painful. But what Jesus said was that in a little while, there's going to be a lot of pain. But really, what happens after all the, you know, the, the baby is, in the, is safe and secure in its mother's belly, and the baby is, is, is all there and been there for nine months and enjoying its time uh, in the belly. And all of a sudden, there's this, this is, violence and he or she ends up thinking oh I'm going to die because he's just all this terrible violence and ends up being pushed out and then but then at the end the mother who has been all yelling and screaming starts laughing starts playing with the baby starts enjoying the baby starts saying this is so cute and and then a few years later, let's have another baby. <laughs> Jesus said, that's going to happen to you, disciples. It's going to be painful, but there will be joy at the end. Your sorrow will turn to joy, and this joy will be irrevocable joy. And that's exactly what happened. We know, by the way, John 20, 20 says, On the first day of the week, Jesus rose from the dead. He came to his disciples, shows them his hands and his side. And the Bible says, then they saw, they saw the Lord, and they were glad. You cannot, this joy cannot be destroyed. How, so basically he's saying, this joy will come from the resurrection. Now let's look a little deeper. How can you have irrevocable joy? There's two things must happen. First thing is, the giver of joy must be eternal and not die. The only way that something can be eternal or lot, is that it never dies. It's you know, sort of like a, a video game where you have unlimited lives, Okay. Jesus says, I'm going to just do it once, but I could do it over and over again. No matter what they do to me, I live again and again and again. That's why your joy cannot be taken away from you. Now, I want, you need to look at very closely this text. What kind of joy is he talking about? He says, I will see you again. So me and you, you rejoice and no one will take away your joy. So he's intricately linking me and you. The reason that they will be having eternal joy is because I'll be with you. So therefore, and I think deeper here, what is the source of joy? It's Jesus, him being with you. And how can you have eternal joy? You'll only have eternal joy if you like Jesus. Let me repeat that. You'll only have eternal joy if you like Jesus if you love Jesus, if you enjoy Jesus. Can you imagine, some of you, you know, you don't like the way I, whatever, say something. And then if you don't like me, you go, okay, if I said, I'll give you great joy, I'll, I'm going to stick with you for the rest of your life. Okay? You're going to say, no, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Reverend Ted, you're a nice guy, but I don't really like you that much, right? Okay? But Jesus says, I will be with you, therefore your joy is, the source of your joy is to be with Jesus. So, if your joy is not Jesus, not hanging out with Jesus, not thinking about Jesus, not having Jesus give you information about life, not having Jesus provide for you the miracles you need to go on and on every day, then you won't be joyful. 
And this morning is not quite a guarantee for you this morning, but this morning is an invitation for you to say, Jesus says he wants to be your joy. He wants to be your eternal joy. He wants a heart change in you so that you start joining Jesus now so that you can enjoy him for eternity. There was this young pre-med student um, from Harvard University, and he, was in his, he just finished his sophomore year, and so he traveled to Tibet to go to, the, to meet this monk in a high mountain. And this monk, monk meets him, and, and he says, um, and the monk said to this young pre-med student, you're poisoning yourself, your soul. Because of your success-oriented way of life, you're just too competitive. Your idea of happiness is to stay up all night studying so that you can do well on an exam and get better grades than your friend. Your idea of happiness in marriage is not finding a woman that completes you and makes you whole, but in finding a woman that everyone else wants so you can beat them, your friends, and show what the trophy next to you. That's not how people are supposed to be, the monk told him. Life is not a competition. Give it up. Come join us here in the atmosphere of the monastery. Live in harmony. Love one another. Here we find happiness. The young man had just completed four years of a very competitive high school that, that, that got him into Harvard. And he had worked hard to become one of the top pre-med students in his class at the university. So he was ripe for the appeal of the monk. And the young man decided right there and then he wasn't going to go home. So he stayed there. He dropped out of school. And he lived in a monastery. Six months later, he wrote back to his parents. He said, Dear Mom and Dad, I know you weren't happy with, all the, with the decision I made last summer, but I want to tell you that I'm doing great. For the first time in my life, I'm at peace. Here there's no competing, no hustling, no trying to get ahead of anyone else. Here we're all equal, and we all share. This way of life is so much in harmony with the inner essence of my soul. You know, it's so much in, in, in harmony with me that in only six months, I've become the number two disciple in the entire monastery. And I think I can become number one by June. Had he really changed? What was the source of his joy? It was in competing with other people. And when he, after he becomes number one, he had to have to go to another monastery to be number one there. Jesus says, I want to be your joy. Yes, enjoy the sushi. Enjoy the lobster. Enjoy the golfing. Enjoy your children. Enjoy your grandchildren. Yes, enjoy the car. Enjoy your, 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 your volleyball spikes and all that stuff. Whatever you have, joy. That's okay. But recognize that's not the true source of joy. And those are not eternal. They will not last forever. They will not give you fulfillment. They're just an appetizer. And when the party's over, when the music fades, when everything, when the, the play, the curtain comes down, and you go home and you're all alone, there's a yearning in your heart. You've bitten through the outside of the Easter Bunny and it's hollow on the inside. And you realize you were meant for more than this. And that's a little appetizer to tell you you're more than an animal. Animals have their food, they go to sleep. Humans have your food, and you ask, what's next? That eternal joy is meant for you. And that's Jesus Christ. Christ says, I promise I'm an irrevocable joy, and it's from being with the eternal being. So if you want eternal joy, first you have to have an eternal Savior. Jesus Christ who rose from dead. But then to have an eternal joy, not only do you need an eternal savior, you need to be eternal as well. Because it, look, you know, there's a very simple formula. For you to have eternal joy, you need an eternal source, and you yourself, and the Bible says you will live forever because Christ lives forever, and he proved it by the resurrection. You catch the logic there? The resurrection means you will never die. Now, so many people have settled for less. So many people said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Let me drink as much as I can, get stone drunk, because what's the use anyways? After I die, I'm just going to be eaten by the, by the bugs. 
You know, I'm, I'm going to be six feet under, and there's nothing else to life. Okay, I might as well just take what I can, take the goose out of life, take everything, suck out the, 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 the joy of everything I can, and just use anyone I can, and step on anyone I can, and just abuse anything I want to, as long as I can get away with it, because when I die, you can't punish me anyways, and that's it, and I become dust, and I'm blown in the wind. And people settle for that. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Don't settle for that because you're eternal. And you can live eternally. And this eternal life is not just existence. This eternal life is joy. It's not a zombie existence, okay? You know, I heard that there's this popular TV show, um, Walking Dead. Season, season ending tonight. <laughs> and then this Walking Dead thing, 10 million people out here watch this show. And, and this, in, this, in these zombies, not just that the TV show, but all these zombie movies, what happens? You know, they all live forever anyways, right? They're all infected. They all live forever, right? But no, no. But who wants to live the way they li- those zombies live? Just wandering around in this world with no purpose, no meaning, no thoughts re- either, and just trying to get the next meal. That's not life. That's not the eternal life Jesus promises. Jesus promises true joy, true peace. Yes, in one sense, hey, Reverend Ted, don't we all die? Yeah, in one sense, you physically die. But then you, the Bible says the real you survives. In life or in death, the real you survives with an eternal, deep down joy that lasts forever. Because I live, you will live also. That's what he said. Uh, uh, John 14, 18, 19, similar verses. Jesus says, I will not leave you desolate. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see you no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. John eleven twenty five and 26, he says to, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who, be- he who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Nothing can separate you from Christ, even physical death. At a certain point, you might physically die, but you will live eternally with true joy. Christ said, uh, sorry, Romans 8, 38, uh, Paul writes, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, what kind of joy do you want? Temporary joys? You can get it on this earth. There's nothing... I, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's no joy in play, playing with toy trains. There's no joy in going to movies. There's no joy in, 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 in listening to some nice music and going to a museum and taking a cruise. Okay, I'm not saying there's no joy in there. But are you going to settle for that joy? Or are you going to prepare for an eternal joy with Jesus Christ that can never die? Don't... Settle for the wrappings and the appetizers. In the heyday of the Napoleonic era, French troops fanned out all over the globe trying to share the best of France with the rest of the world, their colonies, to bring the best of the colonies back to France. This included some kind of cultural exchange, and, and during this cultural exchange, the troops stole things from all over the world, and they took a bunch of Egyptian artifacts and they brought them to, the, to, to France. And... As the empire, the French empire waned, many of these treasures found their way into the basement of their museum, of the, of the Paris Museum. In the 1940s, some workmen uncovered a burial case, c- casket squeezed into an obscure corner in the basement. They decided this box was very elaborate and make an excellent storage case. So without consulting the museum's caretakers, they simply emptied the contents of this casket into the Paris sewers, and they filled it with odds and ends of Egyptian artifacts. Sometime later, someone discovered that these workmen, in dumping the contents of that casket, had dumped out the contents, the body of Cleopatra of Egypt, and they filled it with all these trinkets. The box was nice. They had no idea what the contents were. It's like the children that go to Disney World and don't want to go inside Disney World because they love the tram ride in the parking lot. They have no concept what's inside. It's like the, the children that play with the box of the present, Christmas parent, present, and they don't worry about the contents. Yes, it's pretty, the joyful things in this world, 
But no, there's no substance. It doesn't last. Don't throw the good things away and settle for the trinkets. How can you have eternal joy? If you've never been here before, you've never been to a church, it's very simple. You need to recognize that, you, that you're a sinner, that Christ is God, man. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for his sins. And now the anger of God, the wrath of God has been satisfied. And God has absorbed that wrath in himself and he's dealt with it at the cross. And now God is not angry with you if you ask him for forgiveness of sins and come to him, come to him as, as his child. Eric Clapton, it was 1969. Eric Clapton, I, I mean, some of you don't know who he is. For me, he was, he was a rock legend, and, and it's my day. <laughs> I grew up with Eric Clapton, and he was a rock star, and he was good friends with George, George Harrison. Again, some of you don't know who George Harrison is, but he was a Beatle, okay? okay not, a, a Beatle is a rock group, okay? <laughs> okay? It's not an animal, okay? Not an animal, just, just in case some of you. No, no, what a beetle is. So he was Harrison and Clapton were the best of friends. But 1969, what happened was Clapton fell in love with Patty Boyd, the wife of George Harrison. And they kind of, you know, they, 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 he loved her, but he, it was unrequited love because it was his best friend's wife. And he even wrote a song. It's called Layla. Layla is, is, is meant for Patty Boyd. And uh, some of you guys might know that song. It's a very famous rock song. And, and so he, and then, Finally, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't keep their love from each other very much longer. And then Patty ended up with Eric, and she divorced George Harrison. And she ended up marrying Eric Clapton. They got, by the way, they divorced later on too, so <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> but at that time, the shocking news was that George Harrison forgave Clapton, and he actually went to his wedding. He's one of the men at his wedding, part of his wedding. For his, the, of his former wife with his best friend. Somehow, George Harrison figured out the ability to forgive his, his friend. And he somehow absorbed it within him. Because this friend could never do or never make up for what he did, stealing the wife of his, of, his, of his own wife. God did that with us. You've done a lot of things against him. Every day, you sin. But you can be forgiven. God says... I hate sin. I hate it so much. Look at what I did on the cross. I allowed to have done to my son on the cross. But I don't have to do that to you. You can come to him this morning. Ask him to forgive your sins. Deal with them now. And then the Bible says you are given an unconditional guarantee of irrevocable, as long as Jesus lives, you will live, and your joy with him will never, ever, ever, ever die, no matter what happens to your job, to your marriage, to your children, to your health, to your relatives, to your friends, to this church. Nothing can take away your joy. Do you believe it? Is Jesus risen? Yes, he's risen indeed. Let's pray. Our, 